All right. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, master class. I'm Scott Stafford with OlympiaHomeSource.com and eXp Realty. And in this video, we're going to be covering advanced home selling strategies that are going to keep you from losing thousands of dollars. And I don't want to waste a lot of time. We have a ton of stuff to get through. So I'm just going to jump right into it. What we're going to go over here, we're going to learn some advanced strategies that are going to keep you from losing out on thousands of dollars when you sell your home. And as we go through these, you're going to be able, you're going to feel very confident in your, in your decision to move forward because now you have the right information and you can make confident, educated decisions. And I'm sure you guys can all agree with me that when it comes to selling your house, probably one of your most uh, valuable assets, it's definitely good to have confidence in doing so and uh, and being very educated on what's going on in this in this really this crazy market that we've got going through right now. Um, you know, and, and as we go through this too, I want to I want to point this out before we get into it. I, you guys, be very patient with me because everybody's situation is different, and so many cases you're going to find yourself agreeing with me. And uh, and then there's going to be times where it doesn't apply to you or it doesn't uh, doesn't meet your situation, and you and you may disagree with me and 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 think to yourself, well, that doesn't apply to me, and that is completely okay. So uh, just kind of laying out some some ground rules here. Uh, real quick to a little bit about me. I just want to take a second here. So you do know who you're, uh, who you're listening to today, who your coach is today. And, uh, it, you know, knowledge is power. And I've been uh, a real estate investor since 1992. I bought my first foreclosure house in 1992. Um, had a, had a little bit of a contractor background at the time. Well, I shouldn't say that I was 20 years old. Um, but I, my, yeah, my dad was, was always in contracting. I was always around real estate. One of my best friends, dad was, was a developer. So even growing up, I was, I've always been around around real estate. Uh, but so I, bu I bought my first foreclosure house in 1992. My dad and I went in and we, we fixed it all up ourselves and ended up moving into it. And uh, the house is still in the family even to this day. So that was kind of my introduction into real estate. Uh, became a contractor in 1998. I've, all of this was in Thurston County too. I've been a lifelong uh, Olympia area resident, well, at least uh, since about 1985, 86, I think I've been here. Um, been a general contractor since 1998, uh, built probably a hundred, 120 homes around custom construction. We had a design build company up until about 2008. Uh, you probably know what happened in 2008, the real estate market changed drastically. And, and we'll be talking about that and, and kind of talking about what the market is doing right now, uh, because history uh, does tell us a lot about what, what is going to happen in the future. Uh, around 2010, I started uh, real estate coaching. I just kind of stumbled into it. I started uh, uh, teaching people about real estate, teaching people about the things I've learned over the years, uh, became a, a public speaker, and again, just kind of fell into this and uh, started educating and training people all over the country, uh, real estate wise. And uh, it was great. Uh, you know, and again, uh, and then and then life throws us a curveball, right? And the curveball that we've all experienced is uh, COVID over the last few years. So I was doing public speaking, uh, had my real estate license too. I got my real estate license in 2012, uh, not long after I started coaching and speaking. And uh, just doing a lot of training. I've, I've trained thousands of people all over the country and uh, spoken and, and trained in 48 different states and uh, really enjoyed doing that up until COVID hit, of course. And then uh, a lot of that uh, stopped for the time being. And, uh, and so been a real estate broker since 2012. I've uh, done a lot of training on sales and negotiation all over the country and uh, really been in the, in the real estate industry in one, one form or another uh, for, for over 30 years. And I'm really going to share with you some of my best things that I've learned. Uh, always continuing to learn. I, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong uh, student. I'm a lifelong educator. And uh, so, you know, with the things going on in the market there, there are some things that, uh, you know, the market, the market is not, is, is so different than what it was 10 to 20 years ago. The, the, you know, the way we, the way we approach real estate, the way we market real estate, everything has changed. And I really feel like um, a lot of people in the industry are still stuck doing what, uh, what worked, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, even. And so, uh, we're going to be covering, uh, quite a few things here. Uh, number one, we're going to be covering what is really going on in the market. So we're just going to jump right into this here and go over, uh, actually, I'm, I'm just backing up a second here. I just real t touch on the five things, the five main things that we're going to cover here. We're going to go over some, just some, you know, some details about what's really going on in the market. We're going to talk about timing the sale of your home. We're going to talk about the ever important process of pricing. I'm going to give you some pro tips here uh, that I think will su surprise you and excite you at the same time uh, because it's, um, 
it's it's tough it's tough to understand but the data does not lie so i'm going to be sharing with you some some great pricing tips we're going to talk about prepping the house uh, you know to increase the value uh, and we're going to talk about marketing one of my favorite things to talk about is marketing and all of this is with the goal of helping you sell your house for more money uh, make it easier for you and i'll tell you what right now uh, we are in such a crazy seller's market, but yet we're still very, very low on inventory, which is very strange. If we're in such a great seller's market, why aren't people selling their homes right now? And we're going to cover that. And I'm and, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to tell you the number one reason why people aren't selling their home right now. And uh, hopefully, we're going to give you some solutions that are going to kind of ease your mind. Because and I'll give you a little bit of hint. A lot of it has to do with fear. You know, a lot of people are concerned about selling their home right now, uh, but they're afraid that when they sell their home, and this may, you know, you may fall into this category, you're afraid that when you sell your home, I might have a hard time uh, finding my next home. I might end up homeless. And so we're going to cover that. We've got some really, really exciting things, really some innovative things coming too, some of which I can share with you, some of which I'm still working on right now. And I will be sharing with you very, very soon that are going to take some of those main challenges that sellers and, and buyers are having right now and, uh, and solve those problems. I'm so very excited about it. Uh, so some of it I can share with you, some of it I cannot. We're in the process of working with a, a company right now that uh, is just really innovative and groundbreaking, and, and they're going to really shake shake up the marketplace. And so I'm very excited to share that stuff. Uh, some of it we may have to do on a kind of a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Uh, you know, we've got people on this video right now. We've got people probably that are going to be watching this on a replay. And uh, I have to be careful about what I can put out there without having everything 100% solidified. So anyway, enough of that, uh, enough of who I am. This is about you guys. So we are going to just get right into it on what is really going on in the market right now, just so you have some context to what we're going to be speaking about in this video. Uh, right now, the market is being driven by baby boomers, and uh, the baby boomer boomers are downsizing. They're uh, they're selling. They're relocating. They're they're in a, a transition phase of our life. And if you look at this graph here. You can see that you know 55 to you know age 64 uh, is where the majority of the people are uh, yeah, active in the market. You've got males on the left and females on the right, and you can see there the the top yellow line is the baby boomer demographic, and the millennials is the second uh, the second market driver, the second group of people that are really driving the market right now. And, and a lot of the millennials are you know first time home buyers, uh, they're moving out of rentals maybe. And uh, both of these are really driving the market. And, and really the third market, is, as we touched on earlier, is COVID. It's really, really been interesting to see what the market has done since COVID have hit, has hit. Uh, we're in early 2022 right now. And uh, man, 2021, right in the midst of COVID, was, was one of the best markets that we've had as far as, uh, as, far as being a seller's market. Interest rates were good. Uh, there was a little bit of a dip, obviously, when COVID first hit, when everybody was just like in shock and everybody got locked down. I'm sure you all remember that. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that's kind of just what's going on and who's driving the market right now. It's it's really the baby boomers and the millennials. Um, let's talk real quick about mortgage rates. Uh, the mortgage rates right now are starting to climb, as you've probably heard if you've watched the news. Uh, it's no surprise there. But uh, just just something here: the, the Treasury bill is something that is really the. I'm sorry, I'm sorry not Treasury bill. The Treasury yield. Uh, the consensus with experts around the the real estate community is that the Treasury Treasury yield is going to climb to you know 2.8 to 2.9 by the end of 2024. The, what, what's interesting about this is the interest rates really follow the treasury yield. You can see there on the graph, the 10-year treasury yield and the 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage rates, th there's about a 1.7% spread. So whatever the treasury yield does, mortgage rates tend to follow. And again, history repeats itself. So right now, and this is a projection from Freddie Mac, 
Uh, interest rates, a quarter one. This is a, just a projection. So uh, some of these you know, may or may not come true. We don't know. It's a projection. We don't have a crystal ball. But uh, quarter one, we're looking at about a 3.4 and then increasing by about a, a tenth of a percent every quarter. And looking at the end of quarter four, we're looking in the neighborhood of you know, creeping up on 4%. And uh, the, the based on 50-year history following the yield, that would likely put mortgage rates at about 4.5% in three years. Now, the thing, the stuff going on in Russia currently, obviously that's going to have an effect on the mortgage rates as well. So we're kind of eagerly watching that to see what that's going to do. So what does all this mean to you? Uh, really, it, it talks. It, it really has to do with affordability. And if the mortgage rates are at two point seven five percent, you can see what your payment is there at uh, sixteen hundred a month. That same sixteen hundred a month, uh, as rates go up to just even a quarter percent to three percent, now you can only a three, or afford a three hundred ninety thousand dollar home. And as rates jump another quarter percent, now you're down to three eighty. So you can see there's a correlation there on what people can afford. Board. And what's what's crazy about that is market rates, interest rates are going up and values of homes are also going up at the same time. So as the interest rates continue to go up, people can afford less, but yet the values are still going up. So we have to be very careful of what's going on there. The other thing that's really interesting right now is the months of inventory. So this is a graph of showing from uh, 2017. Uh, we've we've been in a seller's market since about, as you'll see on the next slide, we've been in a seller's market since right around 2015. And just to give you a definition of what a seller's market is, okay, there's months of inventory. What months of inventory means is if, if no other homes came on the market right now, if there's two months of inventory currently on the market, if no other homes came on the market, the, the number of buyers that we have buying properties, we would run out of properties in two months. That's what they mean by they're saying there's two months of inventory. If nothing else came on the market, we would be out of homes for sale in two months. That's two months of inventory. So as you can see here, on the graph, we've we, around to January, July to 220, uh, January 220 inventory really started to drop off. And that's incidentally about when COVID hit. And it's, it's kind of creeped around less than a half of month of inventory. Now, to give you some context on that, a traditional market, okay, you've heard about a buyer's market and a seller's market. A tradition, a, a, a balanced market is six months of inventory, a balanced market. We are currently in Thurston County, we are currently uh, at less than, a, less than a month of inventory. And it fluctuates a little bit, as you can see by the graph there. But that red line indicates what is, is, is a, a seller's market. Anything above six months of inventory, it's a buyer's market. Anything below six months of inventory is a seller's market. We are at a half a month of inventory currently right now. You can see it is an extreme uh, extreme seller's market. Okay, so uh, that's good news for sellers. Now, buyers, on the other hand, people that are buying homes, it's tough. It's really tough out there. You know, most homes are getting multiple offers on them because there's not many homes out there, uh, which again is good for sellers. But if you're thinking about buying your next home, this could be a challenge. And we do have some solutions for that as we'll get into. Uh, so just, just really just quick on, uh, context on that. What's really going on the market? Uh, this is new listings for 2021. Now, this is kind of interesting to see. Obviously, uh, you know, the summer months, Ju June and July are when the most listings are available. This is all Thurston County. So these are new listings hitting the market in Thurston County. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about timing the market here shortly as well. When is the best time to sell? When is the best time to buy? Okay. And lastly, we're going to talk about as far as the graphs go here for a minute. We're going to talk about what's really going on in the market as far as um, uh, average prices. Uh, it's just been crazy, and COVID did not slow it down one bit. You can see uh, in January of 2020, 2020, excuse me, the average home in Thurston County was 388,000. In uh, one year later, the average price of a home went up to 445. And this uh, 2021, the average home in Thurston County went up. And this is all according to uh, realist uh, data from the MLS. 
And the residential homes in 2021 rose 11.3 percent in Thurston County. So the average home price went from 445 all the way up to dang near 500 at 495. So uh, the market's good. If you bought a home uh, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, congratulations. You've done very, very well on appreciation. And a lot of people are just, you know, choosing to cash in on that appreciation, maybe even buy some rental properties with some of that appreciation or, or fix up their current homes and things like that. So what we have in a nutshell, sellers are in control. Buyers are, buyers are aware of what they're up against. There's a lot of competition and buyers know this. We have historically low inventory. We have interest rates that are starting to creep up. Interest rates start to creep up. More buyers that have been sitting on the sideline think, okay, I know it's tough out there, but I got to get in before interest rates go up and before homes continue, the, you know, values continue to climb. Uh, one of the challenge, another one of the challenges with buyers out there is that uh, you know they're saving up for their down payment, but uh, the prices of houses are going up faster than they're able to save for their down payment. So, millennial buyers are looking to jump into the market and be first-time home buyers. Baby boomers are looking to downsize, relocate. Uh, it, it's kind of the the perfect storm that has created an extreme seller's market, which continues to drive prices up. And we will continue to talk about the seller's market and the buyer's market as we go. So if there is such a great seller's market, why is inventory so low? Why aren't more people selling? And the answer to that is fear. We, we, just, we touched on this earlier. If it's such a great market, why, are not, why aren't more people selling their homes right now? It's fear of not being able to buy their next home. You, you, you go out and you put your home up for sale on the market. You get a buyer in two to three days. And uh, then you have to go start shopping for your next home, and uh, and now you're now you're in the buyer's uh, you, know, you know again the sellers are in, in the driver's seat. Now you're a buyer going out there, and now you're faced with a lot of competition and what. I will say though that if you have uh, a lot of equity in the home, uh, you are going to uh, it's going to be very helpful if you have a couple hundred thousand you know to put down on your next house or more. So that's going to make your offer very strong. So that does help you. So uh, we will kind of do more to alleviate some of that fear as we go through this. Okay. So sellers know that they can sell their house very quickly, but they're fearful that they won't, well, they'll, they won't be able to find their next house and they'll end up homeless. So that's just, that's just some, uh, some real quick data on what's going on in the market right now. Uh, just so you have some, some knowledge and some, some information. Okay. So next we're going to talk about timing. Okay. And this is, we're talking about timing. Like when is the best time to sell? When is the best time to buy? How, how do I time it right where I can, you know, buy my next house? So we're going to go over some, some options here. Uh, it's supply and demand. It really comes down to supply and demand. If you look at this graph, this is one we touched on earlier. Most of the homes are hitting the market in June, July, and August in the summer months. Okay. So more homes are coming on the market. That's actually a better time to buy because you have more to choose from and there's less competition. The best time to sell the house is generally, and again, this, these are generalizations. Uh, the, the best time to sell the house is uh, oftentimes in the springtime because there's less, there's, there, there's less homes on the market. Buyers are still there, but there's less homes on the market. Um, it, 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 when, when, when looking about timing the market, it's, it's also like kind of like trying to time the stock market. It can be very difficult to do because uh, you may you may look to sell your house in spring and then buy your house. But if if property values are still continuing to go up, you know, I just I, what I, I guess what I'm saying is here is don't overthink it too much. When is the best time for you to sell your house? That's the main thing that you need to come up with here. But with supply and demand, a lot of people think the best time to put their home on the market is the summertime. And just just understand that. Eh, something to think about. There are more homes that are coming on the market uh, during the summertime. So supply and demand says that you might not sell your house for, for as much. So some things to think about. Ultimately, though, I think it comes down to what is best for you. What is best for you in your situation uh, when it comes to selling? Okay. So there's really three scenarios here that we have when we talk about timing your home. And I'm talking about selling your home and then buying the next home. Uh, common objection, you know, where am I going to move to? And, and these are three situations. Obviously, your situation could be greatly different than this. 
Uh, the first, the first situation is, you know, you, you already have a, a place to go to. So this is the easiest, this is the least amount of stress, but unfortunately we have to be honest that not everybody is in this, this position. Uh, the nice thing about doing it this way is that you, uh, you can take a little bit more time to find your, your next home. You can kind of try and time the market a little bit. The, the drawback of this particular scenario, I'm going to, I'm going to walk through it here in a little bit more detail is that you may end up with two mortgage payments. So what we're looking at here is uh, your existing uh, your existing house is on the top there. You need to sell it. Your your house, your new house that you're going to buy is on the bottom. So one way to start doing this, if you can afford the two mark the, the the two mortgage payments, if you can qualify for another mortgage, all of that has to you know come into play. Is to just go ahead and start shopping for your new home now. You can take your time. You can take all the time you want. You can find the right house that you want. Uh, you uh, you put in the offer. Your offer is accepted, and you close on the property. Once you buy your new home, you go back to your old home. You move out. You move into the new home. You prep the new the old house for sale, and then you list the home. You get the offer accepted, then the, and then you close. This is the easiest way, I think, in a, in a perfect scenario that you would do. Not everybody is in a financial position to do this, though. So if you are, that's great. Now, sometimes, and I'm going to show in, in another scenario here, uh, we can use some of the equity in your existing home to uh, buy the next home. And that's also a possibility that we'll streamline this and make this easier. Uh, the key that here is to really have a good mortgage broker on your team. And obviously, we've got some recommendations of people that have been in the Thurston County area here that uh, we highly recommend. I, I'm a big believer in using local, uh, local lenders, local mortgage brokers, because, you know, if there's an issue, we want to be able to to deal with it right away and not get stuck on some, you know, 800 or number or something like that, where we're stuck on hold for 45 minutes trying to talk to one of the big national uh, lending companies. But again, it's your choice on who you you use there. Okay. So uh, another option here is your existing house again on the top, the new house that you're looking to buy on the bottom. Another scenario here is let's go ahead and get your house ready to sell. We're going to talk in, in the section where we talk about preparation. We're going to talk about you know staging. We're going to talk about decluttering, making repairs, all of that kind of stuff. But let's go ahead and start prepping your house to sell now. We get it ready. We get it de decluttered. We get some of the little minor, you know, health and safety type things fixed. And then we go out and start shopping and uh, take all the time you want. Find the house that you find the house of your dreams, make an offer, get the offer accepted. Once that offer is accepted on your new house, then we're immediately going to go back and list your old house. Okay, and with the market right now, homes are selling. We price it right. We market it right. Uh, you're likely to get an offer very quickly. And you get that offer accepted. Uh, after your offer is accepted, we go ahead and close on the new house. You move out of the old house into the new house, and then you close on the back end. And those closing dates on this example, those closing dates can vary. Uh, ideally, we would try and time this where the, the, the two homes are closing you know, right about the same within a few days of each other or a few weeks, uh, worst case scenario. So that's, uh, that's an example of buying without needing to sell your existing home. The pros of that is you're going to close about the same time. You don't need to do a contingent offer. We're going to talk about that in a second. And the drawback here is you may have double mortgage payments for a short time, and you do need to qualify for that. That's, once again, where a good mortgage broker is going to help you out. Let's talk about a contingent offer real quick. Uh, just one of those terminology things that you should be aware of. If you have an existing home that you need to sell, and you need to sell that home before you can buy the next home. You can put in what's called a contingent offer. So we could go find your new home that you want. You put in an offer, a contingent offer, and says, I'll buy this house, but I have to sell my other house first. Okay, because I'm going to take the proceeds of that house and we're going to put it into that into, into the new house. That's called a contingent offer. The 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 purchase of the new house is contingent upon selling your old house. Now think about that from a seller's standpoint. I'm selling the house that you want to buy. You come to me and say, 
yeah, we, we'd like to buy your house, but we have to sell your house first. There is, uh, there's a little bit more risk on my part because maybe you, I haven't seen your house. Maybe your house won't sell. Maybe you're going to price it unrealistically. Maybe you're going to get it under contract and the buyer's going to walk out, which then messes up my side of the sale. So contingent offers are not the most attractive to sellers. Yes, they still get accepted. But in a market like this, if again, if I'm a seller and you bring an offer to me and I get a contingent offer um, that you have to sell your house first, but I also got another offer that's not a contingent offer. Maybe it's an all cash offer or maybe it's fully financed conventional loan with 50% down. Which offer am I going to be more likely to take? I'm probably going to take the offer with less risk, even if it might be a little bit less money. So so putting in contingent offers uh, is going to, I mean, I'm not going to say it's going to put you to the bottom of the pile, but it is going to make it more difficult. So we want to try, and when you are buying your next home, we want to try and avoid putting in contingent offers if possible. We can work with you. Every scenario is different. We can put you in touch with some mortgage brokers. Maybe you already have a mortgage broker. So just some things to think about there. Okay, next one. Uh, buying without needing to sell. So in this example, this is this is an option what we can do here. So again, we're going to prep your house, your existing house. We're going to prep it for sale right out of the gate. We're going to start shopping. You're going to get your offer accepted and you're going to close on the new home. You're going to move and then we're going to list and uh, get your house sold and get it closed. Double mortgage payments is a possibility here. Uh, we wanna once again, try and close around the same time, but uh, this one, we don't have to close as quickly. We wanna close as quickly as possible after you buy the new home, but I would expect, you know, probably figure 30 to 60 days, maybe 90 days, depending on where you price your existing home to sell, uh, you may have two to three months of, of additional mortgage payments. So you have to prepare for that. Now, uh, uh, another example to look at here is which we talked about is buying with a contingency. So we're going to start out by prepping your existing home for sale. We're going to meet. We're going to talk about decluttering. We're going to talk about staging. We're going to talk about pricing and just get all of that stuff out of the way first. Then we're going to go shopping. We're going to start looking for your new home. You're going to make a contingent offer. Uh, understanding that a contingent offer is probably, that's one of the cons of this scenario is the sellers don't like the contingent offers. But the nice thing about this is we can close, uh, you know, pretty close simultaneously or, or within a few days, ideally. Okay. So once you get your offer uh, accepted on your new home that you're going to buy, we're immediately going to list your home. Now it takes typically 30 to 40 days to close uh, a home. And so what we want to try and do is we want to try and time those two closings. So they happen almost simultaneously, probably not going to have it on the same, but ideally we would close one on a Tuesday. We would close the sale of your new home on a Tuesday and we close the sale of your old home on a Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. So th that's all about timing. Um, you know, there's so many factors to talk about when it comes to timing this right. Does it always work out perfect? Yeah, most of the time, uh, if everything goes well. But there's inspections to get through. There's, there, you know, that when you're when you're selling a house, there's there's you know, a couple of things that we really want to make sure we get through. Number one is is the inspections. Make sure the inspections pass. Number two is making sure the appraisal uh, comes in at value. We'll talk about that uh, very soon. So those are just little things, little wrenches that can be thrown into generally it's inspections and appraisals. And so um, here is another option though. Okay. And this is where, again, as a seller, you kind of have control. So we want to pay attention to this one here. So what we're going to do here is prep the home for sale. Your existing home, we're going to prep it for sale. We're going to list it. And we're going to get the home on the market. At that same time, you're going to start shopping for your new home. Okay. You're going to get an offer accepted on your old home. Okay. I hope you're with me here. Now, here's what happens very often in the market. Because buyers, the buyers know how competitive it is. And I get this all the time. I'll get a phone call from a listing agent. Hey, we love the house. We walked through it today. We're going to put in an offer. And one of the first questions they ask me is what is your seller looking for? This is what puts you in the driver's seat. They ask, what is your seller looking for? So one of the things we can do is we can inform the buyers that, you know what, we need a longer than normal close because we're trying to find the next house. 
Okay. So we can inform buyers that, you know what, if you want to make your offer very strong, uh, our seller would love to have a 60 day close instead of your typical 30 day close. Now you just bought more time. Now that, that doesn't mean that they're going to, to give you that offer. Maybe the buyer has to be in, in 30 days or 45 days. Maybe they can't go 60 days. And that's, then that's certainly a possibility, but we, if we can inform and, th- and this is my job as your realtor, uh, we will inform the potential buyers that, the, that you need a, a longer than normal close because we are in the process of, of finding your next home. So what we do is we inform the buyers that we need a 60-day close, gives you another month to find your next property. And on your next, next property, you're going to have your typical 30-day close. And we try and align those closing dates about the same time. There's, there's, there's also other things that come up uh, quite often, and that's what's called rent backs. Okay, this is another thing. You as a seller may want to ask a buyer to rent the home back to you after it closes. Now, um, this is a very slippery slope, in my opinion. Rent backs are always, and this comes from my investor background, rent, rent backs can always be very difficult. Now you're on the other end of it because you're the renter, but I just, just talking about rent backs, um, and, and I, I hope you're all following me here. And if not, you just schedule a call and we'll, we'll go over this in more detail. I'm trying to, trying to be as quick as possible about this. But um, uh, rent backs can be tricky because you sell your house now the new buyer owns the house, but they're going to let you stay in the house for another 30 days or, or two weeks or 10 days or whatever, whatever that may be. You as the renter, you're probably okay. But on the other hand, um, it, th- talking about rent backs, it can be fairly difficult. You need to be very familiar with landlord tenant laws, especially here in Washington state. Um, it's a very tenant friendly state. Let's be perfectly honest. And if you were the seller, I'm sorry, if you were the buyer, of the new property, you need to be very careful about rent backs. If you ever find yourself in this scenario, uh, and I'll, I'll paint a picture for you. You're selling your house. Uh, the new, the, your, uh, the, the buyers, uh, I'm sorry, the, the people that are selling you the house, you're buying a house, the people that you're buying the house, they want, uh, they want to rent back from you. So you're going to sell them the house and, uh, they want to stay in the house for another 30 days. Okay. Now, what if they decide that they don't want to go? You know, what if something happens, situation changes, and you say, you know, you know what? Yeah, you can go ahead and stay in the house for an extra 30 days. Um, I'll rent it back to you. What if they decide they don't want to leave? Now you have to go through an eviction process. And of course, we just came out of an eviction moratorium. So as you can see, rent, renting back uh, can be a little bit of a slippery slope. So I definitely encourage you to uh, enroll the services of a real estate attorney that's very familiar with uh, landlord tenant laws in Washington state. Uh, be cautious of rent backs is all I'm saying. Okay. Um, another scenario here that we can talk about is, is trying to time the market. If you remember that, that graph that we looked at there, the majority of the properties are coming on the market in the summertime, uh, supply and demand, your, your best time to sell your house is going to be in the springtime. Your best time to buy a house is uh, probably in the summertime. You can try and adjust it for max profit. But to me, once again, this is, you, you see people trying to do this is, to me, it's almost like day trading or, or trying, to, trying to see what the stock market is going to do. We don't know what the economy is going to do. We don't know what the, you know, the government's going to do. We don't know what new war is going to start, you know, what interest rates are going to do, what property values are going to do. So trying to time the market is really... Uh, just, just something that you really, really need to think strongly about. And we, we could certainly advise you on that, but ultimately it's up to you to decide on what's best for you, but you could, uh, you know, um, get your, get your existing home ready to sell, put it on the market in the springtime, get the offer accepted, closing on it. Now, where are you going to live? You gotta, you gotta, you know, probably get, get, lock yourself up in a hotel for a couple of months uh, until summertime comes around and get your other house sold. But you, you can try and time the market, but you know, most people don't do this, but I thought I would throw this slide in there anyway. Uh, we talked about using the equity in your existing home. Uh, this is called, there's options out there called a bridge loan or a home equity and a, H, a HELOC, which stands for home equity line of credit. So I want to just touch on that option here very quickly. We've got mortgage brokers that will help you with this in more detail. 
let's say you have an existing house that's worth 500,000 and you still owe, you've been in the house for 20 years, whatever, you still owe, let's say $50,000 on that home. You can get a home equity line of credit. Now, uh, uh, home equity lines of credit will typically go up to 70%, 80%, some of them 90, 95% loan to value. That's the LTV there. So just some real estate jargon, loan to value is, is the, the value of the house minus what you owe. So just to keep math simple, if you have a house that's worth a hundred thousand, which <laughs> nobody in this, in this, uh, County has a home that's at a hundred thousand, but it's easy for me to do the math. Okay, so you have a home, the value of the home is 100,000 and you owe 60,000 on the home you, to, the, to, the, to the bank, you have a 60% loan to value ratio. Okay, so home equity lines of credit, they start around 70% loan to value. So, uh, but again they, again, they even go higher. So let's say in this example, your existing house is worth 500, you owe 50. If you take the, the existing value of 500,000, 70% of that is 350. Okay. Everybody follow me. That is uh, that is how much, that is the maximum loan to value on a 70% LTV home equity line of credit. That's the maximum amount that you could borrow. Now, if you get an 80 or 90, you can adjust those numbers accordingly. So we have an existing value of 500,000, 70% loan to value home equity line of credit or bridge loan uh, says that they'll go up to 350, but you already owe 50,000 on that. Remember, so we have to back that out. That means you could potentially tap into $300,000 or more if it's a 80% LTV or 90% LTV, you could tap into potentially three to $400,000 that you could put down on your next home. And, I, and I'll say again, as a buyer, as you as the buyer of your next home, if you put an offer on a property and you're dropping three to $400,000 down, that is going to be a very, very strong offer as opposed to a contingent uh, sale. And you just went from the bottom of the stack all the way up to the top of the stack if you can put down three or $400,000. So that's kind of a, a, a tip there that you can use. Talk to a mortgage broker, talk to us, we'll put you in touch with one, talk to, to a mortgage broker if you already have one, about a bridge loan or a home equity line of credit if you have some existing equity in your home. This will make buying your next home uh, potentially easier. Obviously, uh, it, it, it comes up to you on what is the best for you and your situation. Here's another little pro tip. One of the another thing that we that we come that we run into because of the market is so crazy. Uh, let's say there's a home listed at six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Right now, homes are selling five to six percent above list price. For you to be um, competitive in your offer, you probably would want to offer a little bit over list price. Obviously, that's up, for, up, to, up to you to decide. There's something called a 22 AD, because here's what we run into. Home is listed at 650. The realtor did a good job. They, they, they listed it for sale at market value. All of a sudden, you got everybody that wants this home, and now we're getting offers of, of 675. We're getting offers of 700. We're getting offers at 710, and they're offering more than what the property is listed for. Now, the challenge that we can run into here is if you're financing this, you're going to have to get an appraisal. Okay, so the house is listed at 650. You put in an offer of 700, and you're you're financing it, and your bank is going to send out an appraiser, and the appraiser is going to go, no, nope, this house is worth 650. Now what? Okay, now we have a couple of options here. You can either you can either walk away. Uh, the seller can you can renegotiate with the seller down to 650, or there's what's called a 22 AD. If you really love the house, the AD stands for an additional deposit. And what that additional deposit, it's an additional down payment that will cover the cost of the low appraisal. Okay. I hope I'm explaining this. Okay. So a house is listed at 650. Let's just say for easy math, you put an offer in at 670. Offer gets accepted. 
appraiser goes out, says, nope, house is only worth 650. That 22 AD, if you write a 22 AD with a with an additional $20,000 down, now obviously you have to have the $20,000 to be able to do this, that says that, hey, I'm going to buy this house at 670, even though you've got it listed at 650. And if it doesn't appraise for, for 670, I'm going to pay the difference. That's what an additional down payment will do. It, it is a it, it, it does make your offer look more attractive because appraisals have killed deals before. You know, the house is listed at 650. We put an offer in at 670. Appraiser comes out, says, nope, it's worth 650. Deal could potentially die at that point. Or again, you have options on what we could deal with here. I'm not going to get into all of them right now. I just want you to be aware that there is something called a 22 form 22 AD. It's additional down payment. So when you make an offer on your next home, if you really like it, you could say, okay, I will put an extra 20,000 down on this house. And it gives that seller uh, assurance that if, hey, if it does come in at a low appraisal, that's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm going to cover it up to an additional $20,000. Okay. So that's just kind of a pro tip that the 22 AD is a form that we're seeing more and more of. Okay. Uh, so that's about it for timing. Every scenario is going to be different. As I said, let's have a discussion about what your situation is. Let's see what we can do to uh, make this as simple as possible. Okay. Moving on. We want to keep moving on. Next section we're going to talk about is pricing the house. Okay. So in this section, this section is, is you're going to get excited because I'm going to share with you some strategies that are, that are definitely going to put more money in your pocket. Okay. We talked about those market drivers and everything, uh, baby boomers, millennials, COVID, all of that. Uh, so we want to talk about pricing the property right. This is going to require a little bit of a mindset shift on your part because there, there are people out there. In fact, I just had a conversation yesterday. I was, I was looking at a meeting with just this sweet, sweet lady. She's looking at selling her house. And uh, she said, you know what? I'd really like to try and get to this. It was, it was one of those big numbers that was like, I'd really love to get this. And I thought, well, you know, I think we should be here. Yeah, I'd really love to. Let's just list it here and just see what happens. That is probably one of the worst things you can do. And I had to explain that to her. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through that in, in detail here and hopefully explain that to you as well. Okay. So one of the first things that you want to do, you've probably heard of a CMA. Okay. That stands for Comparative Market Analysis. Um, uh, you can get, you can get house values online. You guys know the, 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 the good old Z website, you, you know, there, there's websites out there that will give you values of homes, but, um, you know, don't, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of how to say this nice. So I just, I, I I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to really, I don't want to knock any of those websites, but just understand that it's an estimate. Uh, there's so many factors that go into what a house is actually worth. And you know, as well as I do that, uh, that, that, that getting a value off of a website an automated value, yeah, that's, that's not the, the, the most accurate way to do that. We've seen, we've seen, uh, you know, values just really, really vary from what, the automated value websites uh, tell you the home is worth. So uh, have a professional look at your home. Uh, a CMA is a comparative market analysis. What we do is we go out and we find uh, like kind properties that have sold within the last six months within a certain radius that have similar square footage, similar bedrooms, similar bathrooms, similar year built. And we, we price the home based on that. You know, that's the thing about the real estate market is there, there is no price tag on a house. So we really have to do a good job and price your house, right. But we have to use the data. Don't use the, the, uh, the websites and you use the websites to get a ballpark idea, but just understand it's a big ballpark. You know, we want to, we want to nail it down. So we, take it even a little bit further. We do a CMA, but we, we call it a pair report. And that stands for Pe Professional Equity Assessment Report. One component of that report is a CMA. We try and go really detailed into it. And I'd be happy to, no problem at all, I don't mind, I'd be happy to put one of these together for you that will give you a really a good understanding of what you're actually going to walk away from. Just because a house is worth you know, uh, $650,000, uh, according to the website, how much are you actually going to walk away with when all the fees are taken into account and all of that stuff? So what we do with our pair report, professional equity assessment, is we take everything into consideration, not just some cost per square foot arbitrary, you know, number that we pull out of the out of, uh, off of a website. Okay, so we we get pretty deep into these things. We do the CMA. We come up with comps. We make sure those comps are like kind comps, and that they've sold within, you know, uh, the the sooner the better, preferably three months. 
the market's moving so fast, you start looking at comps that are, you know, a year, six, you know, a year or over a year, and they're not really that accurate anymore. So we want to find good comps. We do a cost analysis on it. We do a net sheet. So how much money are you going to put in your pocket when this house sells? After all the fees, after all the title insurance, after all of that stuff, you're, you're going to get a net sheet. We're going to show you pricing graphs. We're going to recommend certain pricing um, uh, uh, windows that you should put it on and why. We're going to show you maps of, of the, all of the other homes that are that have sold. You can drive by and look at them. We're going to look at your equity, your existing equity in the home. Again, as equity is is how much money do you have in the home? If you if you have a, a home that's worth a hundred thousand and you owe fifty, you have fifty thousand dollars in equity. So we're going to look at your equity and see how much do you have to pay off. Again, getting you down to a number that is how much you're going to put in your pocket. We're going to talk about pricing strategies and marketing strategies. So I highly recommend getting a pair report. It's a CMA on steroids, and it's it's something that, that we put some time into. And so uh, it really is going to get you the, the, the best information that we have available, and it's going to be the most accurate. So definitely contact me if you want to get a pair report on your house. That's kind of the first step when you're looking to sell. Step number one, let's get in contact with one another. Let's get a pair report going for you. Okay. Uh, looking at, uh, as I said earlier, we're, we're hovering, of course, it dropped off uh, right at the end of 21, which it usually does in December. Uh, but we're ho homes are going over market. Uh, they're going uh, about 106%, 105% of list price in Thurston County. That means on average, I use that $100,000 thing because I'm not that great at uh, doing math in my head. That's why I always have a calculator calculator on me. Um, the, uh, the home's worth $100,000. Uh, it's generally going to sell for 105, 106 homes worth a million dollars. It's going to sell for, you know, a five to 6% more than that. Uh, just generally as a rule of thumb. And we've been going over list price since about uh, January of 2020. And you can see uh, it really started to tip in around 2018 when we hit that seller's market with a couple of little dips in January uh, because, you know, winter months, the, the, the market does kind of drop off a little bit. So, okay. So, uh, you can be prepared that your, your home, assuming that it's priced right, assuming it's in good condition, assuming it's desirable, will probably go over list price. Can't guarantee it, of course, but that's our goal. Certainly in this crazy seller's market, that's our goal is to get you multiple offers and get your house sold over list price. Okay, uh, Days on market. This is crazy. Days on market, uh, you see back in 2017, days on market, average days on market was over, you know, 35 days in, in that neighborhood. It's dropped down now to, you know, average, average time on market right now in Thurston County, I think is like five or six days. So when you put your house on the market, if you market it properly, you price it properly, you, you're going to get an offer very quickly. And we've got some really, really good strategies I'm going to cover here in a minute. Okay. Now asking price, this is something that, that, that we talked about. I told you, I, I, I met with that uh, that gal and and she she wanted a price here and I wanted a price. You really want to make sure that you you price your house at market value, um, and it's difficult to do because and and you you have to look at yourself in the mirror here. This is common. Everybody does it. Everybody thinks their house is better than everybody else's. Right? It's we have it's pride of ownership. People have a tendency to think my house is worth more. And, and you just have to be aware of that fact that, you know what, uh, buyers are out there. You may think your house is better than everybody else's. And maybe it is. I don't know. But buyers are out there looking at ever, other houses too. And so they're not going to have that same emotional tie to your house initially right out of the gate. So you have to understand how important it is to price it right. If we come up, we do our pair report and we say, you know what, I would list it here. You want to list here. You don't want to try and, hey, let's shoot for the sky. And this is what's difficult to understand. You're actually better off looking at this graph. The middle there of the triangle is market value. Okay. Percentage of buyers, the more, if you price it 10% over market value, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get less people looking at it. You price it 15%, you're going to get less people looking at it. You price it below market. You're going to get more people looking at it. Everybody wants a deal. It's difficult to understand. It's difficult to do because I know we want to, we want to get as much money for this house as possible, but I really discourage you from, from tr having that mentality of uh, let's price it high and see what happens. You're actually better off pricing it at market or just a hair below market value and getting more people looking at it and getting multiple offers. I have had this happen time and time again, even on my own house. I've done many, many flips 
I had a house out in the Summit Lake area. This is probably 2017, 18. I was so proud of that house. It was the nicest remodel and the nicest rehab I've ever done. I, I was so proud of it. I put it on the market and that, and I priced it higher than I thought I should because I was so proud of it. And that thing sat and sat and sat. And as you will see in this next graph, that first two weeks is so important. Your activity on the, especially that first week, you can see after about a week and a half activity peaks and it starts to drop off. So if you price it too high, and all the activity comes in here. God, I love the house, but geez, it's just priced too high. You just missed out on the bulk of the buyers. And every week that goes by, you get fewer, fewer showings. And the, the, you probably heard this, the, the listing starts to become stale. And that is, that is a horrible thing to do. And I'm going to show you examples of this exact thing happening. Okay. Price it right and you'll get more buyers. And the key is to get multiple offers. The market will tell us what your home is worth. Okay. If we price it right, the most beautiful thing in the world is to get multiple offers. And then we get to go back and say, okay, bring your highest and best offer once we have multiple offers. And that's where the market will determine what it's going to sell for. Because now you start to create that, that competition. You start to create that auction mentality. You've got five people trying to get your home and boy, they start going up. And pretty soon now we start getting up to that, that, you know, we, we, we listed it here, but when we get multiple offers, now we start to get this going on. And that is the, the best way to do it, not go in there and price it high and, uh, and hope for the best because, you know, it starts to get stale after a week and a half, the, the, the showing start to drop off. And once it sits on the market for four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, six weeks, especially in this market, buyers will look at it and go, God, this thing's been on the market for eight weeks. Huh? Obviously there's something wrong with it. Let's not even go look at it. And that's, that's actually what happens. Okay. So price it right. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but it, it's so important to price it right. Um, the, the, the longer it sits on the market, the less people look at it and the more the price goes down, as you can see here. And th this graph is, is in, a, in, a, in a traditional market. I think it's even, even more so now in this crazy seller's market. Okay. It, it, I really believe that if, you, if a house isn't selling, I'll tell you another story here in a second. If a house isn't selling, there's three reasons. Number one, is it's not priced right. Number two, the marketing has, has been horrible. And number three is back to price. So really there's two reasons. It, price is so important. I, I met a gal, she had a house in a, in a little smaller town around the Olympia area here. Uh, not as many, uh, not as many buyers looking to buy in this smaller town. Um, the house had been listed in, in now in 2021, mind you, 2021, an, an extreme seller's market. Yes, we're going through COVID, but 2021 was an extreme seller's market. The house was listed by three different agents. Okay. She started here, dropped it, dropped it, dropped it, said that agent was, I, 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 I may be, you know, I may be guessing this, but uh, decided that that agent was no good, brought in another agent, priced it here, price drop, price drop, price drop, fired that agent, brought in a third agent, price drop, price drop, price drop, still didn't sell, listing expired. The house was listed by three different agents. It was on the market for a total of 157 days and still did not sell. I met with her. I said, do you want to sell the house or do you want to just put it back on the market? She insisted that we start back up here again. Well, that was 2021. Values have gone up. Yes, values have gone up, but the house has been vacant for that entire year. Now, now we're going on two years of this house being vacant. Uh, house is vacant for two years, needs more repairs, kind of getting a little musty smelling in there. Uh, didn't want to put any money into the house. I said, look, we'll list the house, but we got to list it here. If you want to get it sold, this is where you need to be. We'll have it sold in five to 10 days would be my guess. And um, she, she didn't like it. She didn't like what I said. And so, um, and that's fine. That, that's fine. Uh, best, best of luck to her. But I basically came down to it and said, look, you want to put the house on the market and have it sit and do a bunch of price drops again? Because I'm not willing to do that. I'm in the business of selling homes. That's what I want to do. We want to be able to price it right and get it sold. You're making two mortgage payments right now. Do you want to price drop, price drop, and then you know go through that whole thing again? So listen to the professionals. I mean, that that's I, I can't say it any better than that. Um, we typically, kind of a rule of thumb I have is, is the 10 to one rule of thumb is if we have 10 showings on your house 
and you haven't received an offer on those 10 showings, that's a, that's a red flag. Something is going on. Either it's priced too high, there's something that is turning buyers off. And, and what I really try to do is, is do a good job going to the, uh, the agents that show the home and saying, hey, what did your clients think of the home? Give us some feedback on it. In fact, we have an automated system that does that. It follows up with all the agents that show our listings and uh, we, we uh, uh, elicit feedback from them. And they will tell us that eh, it's priced too high. Uh, clients didn't like this. Clients didn't like this. That feedback then we give to our clients and let them know, and then we can adjust our strategies ahead of time. Okay. So uh, biggest mistakes homeowners make. This was a this was a study done by Active Rain. Asked a thousand real estate agents to rate the top three mistakes made by home sellers. Um, they've given us six. So top three. Number one, seventy seven percent say the biggest mistake is they overpriced the home. I'm I'm beating that dead horse again. Overpricing the home. Uh, showing a, a availability is number two. Now, what that means is, um, and, and, hey, you know what? And you may be in a situation where you can't just have your house open, you know, uh, all day, every day. Showing availability, maybe day sleepers, things like that, that make it difficult to show the home. Maybe there's renters in the home. The renters are, are not wanting people to go through it and they make it very difficult. So showing av availability, we want to make sure that we can show the house as easily as possible and not put a lot of restrictions on it. If we have five people that want to see your home and you won't open that home up until next Friday, it's going to be difficult. So make sure your showing availability is reasonable. Uh, uh, 32% say that cluttered space is another one. So we're going to meet with you. We, we like to stage all of our homes. It's a service. We, we offer uh, consulting, uh, staging consulting service by professional staging companies. We like to come out and, and look at that. We'll help you decide on what needs to be done as far as clutter, but remove clutter, depersonalize the house. That's uh, 32%. Next one is smells, unpleasant odors. Uh, you know, you got cats or I, I mentioned the musty smell in the house that was vacant for two years. Uh, that's 28% uh, unpleasant odors. 21% uh, not willing to negotiate, just being hard, fast. Nope, this is what I want. Take it or leave it. Uh, and 20% won't make repairs. So we're going to talk about repairs as well. Okay. So um, pricing, appraisal. we've already talked about appraisal. So uh, if the home doesn't come in at value, we have to be careful of, um, of, of jacking that up so high that the house doesn't appraise that doesn't help anyone. So, but if you get an offer on your home that you're selling and that buyer has a 22 AD, you can be, uh, you can have some confidence there that they will cover that in the event that the appraisal comes back low. Okay. So have the confidence to know that the market will let you know what your house is worth. This is what I said is, is one of the most difficult things to wrap your head around. Uh, if you don't get offers, it's not it, it, the house is not up to market standards or it's priced wrong. There's just there's no two ways about it, and we will know. We get that feedback very quickly once the listing goes up, and then we pivot at that point. Um, if you get if you get competing offers, a new market value is set. The market will let you know what the house is worth. Okay, buyers know when a house is priced too high. They're out looking at other properties, and yours isn't the only one that they're looking at. So they know when it's priced too high. So um, price it at uh, at market value. Uh, trust your realtor. Trust the data. Trust the comps. Park it. Park it right there at market value, or, or just a hair below market value for maximum exposure. Rely on the expertise of your realtor, your real, real estate broker. Be, be, be flexible and have confidence in the data. And then the ten to one rule: if we have ten showings and you didn't get an offer, there's something going on, and we we probably should should have a powwow about it. Because uh, again, you know, that, that price at high and see what happens strategy is not a good idea because that first two weeks, so we, you know, if, we, if we price it up here for that first two weeks, we just missed all the buyers and everybody that walked through, you go, no, nah, it's priced too high. Okay. So when you price it too high, bad things happen. You get fewer showings, you get longer time on market, the, the listing gets stale. Um, buyers, buyers know the value of comparable homes because they're out looking at other properties. Um, yours isn't the only one they've seen. You're, you're forced to do those price reductions. You're, you're forced. To, uh, also, we haven't even talked about this contingencies after your mark. You know, when you, when you first put your property on the market, buyers are like, they're, they're not putting a lot of contingencies on things because if they know, if I put an offer on your home and I have an inspection contingency and a financing contingency and uh, this contingency, 
contingency and this contingency and a, you know, I got to sell my house contingency. You're probably going to, it's going to go to the bottom of the stack. So right now buyers aren't putting a lot of contingencies because they know there's competition. But when your house gets out there to eight weeks, 10 weeks on the market there, that comp- competition is not there anymore. So you're going to start to see more contingencies. The longer the house sits on the market, you're going to see more repairs needed. We're, we're getting people that say, no, we'll just do a pass or fail on the inspection. You know, we're not even going to nitpick it and say you have to replace the water heater and do all that stuff because they know that they, they can't ask for that or they're going to be at the bottom of the stack. So again, you as the seller are in control. Uh, you'll get buyers asking for closing costs more so the longer it sits on the market. Okay, the, the buyer starts to gain posture in this negotiation. After the thing's been sitting on the market, it's been sitting on the market a week, you have all the posture, you have all the negotiation power. But after that house sits on the market for 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, now the posture starts to shift and the buyer knows, hey, they probably want to sell this thing. And so I can ask them to replace the water heater. I can ask for closing costs. I can ask for this because they know uh, they know that you're, you know, you, you probably want to sell it. Okay. So there you go. Here's an example. Here's an example of a home that's been on the market for 95 days. It was listed originally at 800000 uh, you can see in January of 22, 800,000, and it sat for a little bit and then they dropped it to 750 about a month later. And now here we are sitting at, oh, sorry. They, they dropped it to seven. They, they went to, oh, I'm sorry. No, it was active, uh, active in November of 21. It went active at 800 and then, uh, then they went to 775 in January of 21. And then now they went to 750 at, uh, in February of 2021. So this is, is an example of pricing too high. They've dropped it $50,000. Now, a lot of people will go to that listing and say, oh, gosh, that thing's been sitting on the market for uh, 95 days and haven't sold yet where all the other homes are selling in three to five days. There must be something wrong with this. They, you automatically have that mentality. If it's priced right, there's something wrong with it. It stinks inside. So um, don't get in, don't fall into that trap. Listen to your real estate agent. Um, okay. So ultimately, though, you get to decide. Obviously, it's your choice on where to list it at. But um, I, I think having some of this information and having some of this knowledge is, is going to help you. Okay. So pro tip time. This is one, this is something that uh, we've been doing very successfully uh, and you have to stick to it. But our goal as the listing agent is to get you as much money as we can. So we want to put an offer review date. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll typically list a house on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Okay. And we will set an offer review date for the following Monday or Tuesday with the goal of getting multiple offers. Now, some offers are going to call up and say, you know, can you accept sooner? Now, this is the job of a good listing agent is to is to let everybody involved know that, hey, we are doing an offer review. I have a meeting on Tuesday with my seller. We are going to go over all of those offers on Tuesday. So don't give me an offer that expires in one day. Okay. So again, if you look at a calendar, we're going to list it on a Wednesday or a Thursday. We're going to have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday to really push the property, to really market the property and get as many interested buyers as possible. And we're going to tell them that we're going to review all offers on Tuesday at five o'clock. Make sure your offer is in by four o'clock on Tuesday. Okay. This puts urgency on it. This invites people to put their best foot forward. Um, and what we do is we, we, we put this in the supplemental. So we, so all the ages know, because here's what's going to happen. Okay. And I've seen this multiple times. Okay. We'll put it on the market on a Thursday and we get an offer on Friday that expires on Saturday. Even though we said we weren't going to do offer review until Tuesday, what they're trying to do is saying, here, I'm going to give you an offer, but you have to take it right now. Okay. They're trying to circumvent what we're trying to do. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a chess game. It's a, it's a poker match. And, uh, yeah, and you certainly can, you certainly can accept that offer if it just blows your socks off and it's a, you know, all cash offer. Sure. We can certainly accept that offer, but ideally what we want to do is get everybody on the same page and say, no, we have an appointment at five o'clock on Tuesday to review all offers. And, uh, so make sure that you, uh, make sure that you act accordingly. Okay. Cause we want to get multiple offers. Then we review all those offers. What we do is we sit down with you and say, okay, here's offer one, two, three, four, and five. 
And we've got a nice little spreadsheet. This offer has this, this one doesn't, this one has this price, this one doesn't, this has this contingency, this one doesn't. And we go through and we let, we let you decide on which one you think makes the most sense. And we explain all the offers to you. Um, and then, and then you can, and then the, the nice thing about that too, is that we can go back and the most wonderful thing that a seller can hear is highest and best. We can go back to all five of those offers and say, Hey, we've got a multiple offer situation. Uh, is your buyer interested in raising their price, changing their terms, doing something a little bit, you know, something that helps you out so the seller more. And that's how oftentimes we really do the best job of getting uh, as much money as, as, as we possibly can and getting the offer that makes the most sense for you. So setting offer review dates is kind of a pro tip, but, but what I see a lot of people doing is they set it, but then they don't stick to it. Okay. So we stick to it. We put it in the supplements. We let all the realtors know that, Hey, we've got an appointment on Tuesday at five o'clock. So, you know, act accordingly. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, bu, 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 bu. yeah, multiple offers, highest and best, fewer contingencies, better terms. So here's, here's something too, I want to point out. Okay. Again, our job as a realtors is to represent you and to get you the highest price ethically, honestly, all of that kind of stuff. We don't, we don't want to do, we can't, we don't want to do anything shady, of course, but we want to get you the best possible price. So, Here's a whole bunch of listings. I just pulled this up. Look at all of these and, and look at the red line there. All of those homes sold in zero days, meaning it went on the market on a Thursday and they probably got an offer on a Thursday or, or, or either that Friday morning, right? So all of these offers sold zero days, cumulative time, days on market. That CDOM at the top there, that's cumulative days on market. Now, are you excited if you list your house and you get an offer the same day? Are you excited? Maybe depends on your situation, but here's the question I have for you is, did these realtors serve their clients in the best possible way? Knowing what you know now, did they, serve, did they get the most amount of money for that house that they could have? Um, my answer, you know, is they, they left some money on the table, potentially tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. All of these homes sold in zero days. Uh, so they didn't use the, uh, the, the, the multiple strategy thing that, that we're talking about doing. Now, a lot of realtors use that. This is nothing new. It's nothing you know, life-changing. Like We're the only ones that do it, but we do stick to it. And I think that's very important. All these homes sold in zero days. Most people think, oh, I'm, you know, even a lot of realtors, oh, I see them advertising on Facebook. Oh, we got to sold it the same day we listed it. Well, good for you. But did you get as much money to that house as you could have? And my, my, my thought, my answer to that is no, probably not. Okay. So all these homes sold in zero days. So let's take an example. Okay. This home here, it's at, at, at 799,950. Okay. Sold in zero days. Let's call it $800,000. Now, you know that homes are uh, going for around 106% of list price. Okay. What we want to do is we want to entice multiple offers on that. We're going to be, our homes are going to be, you know, four or five days on the market because we've got that offer review date. But in doing that, we get multiple offers and we're potentially able to sell the house for more money. So uh, if, this, if this home was listed at $799,950 and it sold at $799,50, if we would have uh, timed it right and possibly done an offer review date and had multiple offers, <clears throat> knowing that uh, the average is 106% of list price, that puts that sale at $847,950. Why is it not working? There. That puts it at, at 847950 That's potentially leaving $48,000 on the table. Now, you as the seller, how would you like to have an additional $48,000? Would you be willing to wait another four or five days to have an additional $48,000 in your pocket? My guess is the answer to that is yes. So this is one of those strategies. I told you when we first started this that uh, we've got some strategies that are going to put more money in your pocket and it's going to excite you. I, I hope that a, another $48,000 would be very exciting to you. Uh, and it's just a slight little tweak. Okay. One last thing I want to talk about. I know we're, we're going long here, you guys. I know I'm talking fast. We got a lot of stuff that we're going through here. So ah, thank you. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, I really do hope you're finding this content valuable. I really find, I hope it's, 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 it's helpful. I want to talk about the listing trap for a second here. Okay. Cause again, you see this a lot. Uh, the listing trap. You talk to five real estate agents and 
they do a CMA, they do a pair report, they give you a, 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 an idea of what you think the house, what they think the house should sell for. Okay. One realtor says, oh yeah, 500. The other one says, yeah, in the neighborhood of 500. You know, it's, it's not that difficult if you have good comps. Now, sometimes there, there's no compare comps, comparable sales. Uh, sometimes there's no comparable sales. If you're in a real rural area or you have a very unique property, um, I'm looking right now at a 6,500 square foot duplex listing. There's a 6,500 square foot duplex. There's not a lot of 6,500 square foot duplexes out there. So it's a little bit tough to determine what it's worth. But in a typical house, um, you meet with five realtors. Uh, four of the realtors say, yeah, you should probably list it right here at 500. And then you get this other realtor that comes in here and says, oh, I can sell that house at 575. Now you as the seller, you're inclined to go, well, hell, I'm going to go with the guy that says he'll sell it for 575, even though the other four said 500. Okay. Now what's probably going to happen there? That's what we call a listing trap. They're trying to buy your listing. So you need to be aware of that. Um, make sure that they show you the data that backs up that 575. And, and it, we're, all, we're all operating off of the same data. So if you get one realtor that says, I'll sell it for more, uh, should be a little bit of a red flag going off in your head. Okay. Um, they're trying to buy your listing. Okay. That's all there. That's all there is to it. And uh, maybe they're doing it intentionally. Maybe they're not. I, I, I don't know, but it's something that uh, should be on your radar. Um, you put the house on at 575, you go with that agent and uh, sits on the house for a week, then two weeks, then three weeks, then four weeks, and then we drop it to 560, and then we drop it to 550, and next thing you know, you're down to 500, and the house sells, just like the other four realtors told you uh, it was going to sell. So be, be, uh, be aware of that, okay? Bottom line, there's no price tags on homes. Ultimately, the market decides what your home is worth. A home is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. If someone's willing to pay $2 million for your home, that's what it's worth to that person. It's only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. The key is to get as many of those someones in there and find that one that, is re that, that really falls in love with the home because the market is going to decide what your home is worth. And it's never wrong. Okay. If you list at market value or slightly below, you're going to get more excited buyers. You're going to get more emotion. Uh, people don't like to lose. People love to get a deal. And then once those emotions come in, we get multiple offers. Now we don't want to lose. We want to be competitive. Auction mentality kicks in and that's going to drive the price up. Okay. So hopefully that's a little bit of a mindset shift. We're going to, we're going to just jump right in, keep rocking and rolling here. We're going to talk about preparation preparing your house to sell for maximum dollars. Failing to plan is planning to fail. We want to make sure and have a plan in place. Prior planning prevents poor performance. And I forgot an O in poor. Okay. So what, what would that be? Uh, P-O-R. No, I don't know, even know what that was. So what that would spell. Prior planning prevents poor performance is what that should say. Okay. Preparing to sell your house. Down, if you're downsizing, you know, you're one of those uh, baby boomers, you're looking to downside, donate, declutter, sell. I mean, those are, those are, those are the main things. Again, we'll, we'll have our staging company, uh, uh, home designers come out and take a look and, and give you some tips on stuff. But when you're going through all of that stuff, what do I do with all this stuff? It's going to fall into four categories. You know, you start going through your stuff. Am I going to keep it? Am I going to donate it? Am I going to sell it? Or is it going to the dump? Those are your four choices. If you're going to keep it, great. We might not want it in the house. You may have to you know, get a storage facility for a, a month or so if you have a lot of stuff. Having a lot of stuff in the house is, is, uh, it does make it more difficult to sell. So it's whether you're looking at selling your house now, uh, in a year from now, two years from now, it's time to start thinking about it. Okay, what are we going to... You don't want to get right up to the point of sale. And then, and then there's already enough... Uh, stuff to do. There's already enough uh, stress. We try and minimize the stress as much as, much as possible, to, but there's already enough stress going on that we want to try and minimize that. So anything you can do now, get us in there. Let's, let's talk now. Let's come up with a plan. Even if you're looking at selling a year down the road, okay? Start going through your stuff. Decide if you're going to keep this. Are you going to donate it? Are you going to sell it? And you're going to trash it. We've got, uh, we've got uh, solutions for you. We've got help on all of that stuff, whether you're going to do any of those four things, okay? Um, today's buyers want move-in ready houses. Okay. Preparing your house to sell for maximum dollars. Should I renovate? This is a question that comes up a lot. You know, we're in a seller's market. Homes are being sold in a few days. 
Um, one of the one of the, the the drawbacks and the challenges about doing a major renovation, uh, um, in, unless you've done that kind of thing before, you know, contractors' material prices, contractor pricing is pretty pretty high right now. So if you if you're thinking you're going to go into a major renovation, we would probably discourage you from doing that um, because homes are selling quick right now. You know, although they people want move in ready houses, I wouldn't go into a full kitchen remodel and stuff right now personally unless you're a contractor, unless you've done that kind of thing before, yes, you could potentially get some more money out of it. But you also have to be conscious of missed opportunity. Again, we don't know what's going to happen a month from now. We don't know what the market's going to do six months from now. We don't know what interest rates are going to do. Um, so you might be spending the next six months and putting $100,000 into renovating your house and find that you don't get the ROI that you want and you miss that opportunity. So I would, uh, I would probably discourage you from doing major renovations unless you have that. Uh, that is, uh, and maybe you know, some people are, are homeowners and they're do- DIYers and you can do some of this stuff yourself. Okay, maybe you can consider it. Um, but I, I really don't think you need to right now. Minor repairs, yes. Carpet, paint, making it look nicer, you know, little things like that. Health and safety issues, you want to you wanna, um, definitely tackle if you can. Um, you know, and again, if you're a contractor or a flipper, people will experience, yeah, go ahead and renovate. But uh, be, be careful of, of that missed opportunity. Uh, should you renovate? Uh, uh, the return on investment is what you need to think about. 2020 cost versus value report shows a predictable increase in costs for all 22 remodeling projects, but a consistent dip in the perceived value of those projects at the time of home sale. Okay. So what that says is that it, it's costing more to renovate a home and the values of said renovations are, are, are not uh, perceived as that valuable. Okay. So th- there was a house in, in Renton, um, that uh, homeowner went in and completely remodeled it, put in all new cabinets, and it is sold for eight hundred thousand, something like that. All new cabinets, all new trim, all new countertops, and the people that bought the home, they gutted the whole thing. They didn't like it. Okay, so just food for thought. Major re- renovations, uh, unless you're going to be living in the house for another probably two years, I would probably say no. Things that you can do to bring a, a decent ROI: cleaning. Uh, painting, be careful when you paint, keep it neutral. You know, you can paint, uh, paint the walls, but man, don't, don't go oranges and blues and crazy. Uh, keep things fairly neutral, basic landscaping, clean it up, tighten up the landscaping, put a little mulch down, kind of do some edging. Uh, those uh, remove overgrown bushes. You, you've seen those houses with the, the rhododendron bushes that are, that are, you know, the size of an Oak tree, you know, maybe, maybe look at cutting some of those things down, cleaning your carpets, uh, maybe replacing carpets, replacing flooring, minor repairs, refinishing uh, floors, updating maybe some light fixtures and things like that in the main living areas. Uh, you've, you've got some old uh, 70s light fixtures or something. Sure, may, maybe take a drop in at Home Depot and buy a $50, $60, $100 dollar light fixture or something like that. Uh, painting cabinets can really update the look of the kitchen. Updating trim, updating countertops, removing outdated wallpaper. Uh, those types of things are, are, you can get a good ROI for that. Okay. So at, at best, these are probably things that you want to do. Of course, it's up to you. Um, you, you have options. You can sell it as is. You sell it as is. We're talking more if, you're, if your house does need some work. You can sell it as is. You're going to look more for a DIY buyer, somebody that doesn't mind making some repairs, some investors. Uh, what's interesting, though, is sometimes these houses even sell faster. Okay? You can do minor repairs. Uh, the this, this stuff we had on the last slide there, make it move in ready, make it clean, minor updates, minor repairs, or you can do the major, major renovation. These are all things that you uh, need to consider. Keep in mind the timing, keep in, keep in mind ROI, uh, keep, keep in mind uh, maximizing your sale price. As a, as a flipper, someone who's, who's done uh, many, I, 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 I don't know why I hate that word. Um, as someone who has uh, bought, renovated, and sold properties for profit, I don't know if that's a better way to put it. Um, ROI, I, I, I would not do something. It, to me, it's dollar in, $2 out. If I'm going to spend a dollar on a renovation, uh, if I'm going to spend a dollar on a kitchen, on a kitchen, I want to be able to make two dollars back on that in the end. In the end, so remember, and that's difficult to do uh, unless you're a DIYer, unless you're doing a lot of it yourself. And then you're probably work. You may be working a job. You know, it's going to take. You think it's going to take you two months to rent out your house, and here we are six months later, and you're still not done, and your house is all tore up. So all things to consider. 
uh, oftentimes it's best. Let's just do minor repairs. Let's stage it. Let's market it properly. And uh, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Which rolls right into staging. Why do you want to stage your home? TV shows have changed how buyers look at homes. You see these TV shows and they they just make them look immaculate. Every home that comes on, you get the before and after pictures. So now from, from all of these home improvement TV shows and everything, people expect staging. Um, it, it helps create an emotional response. It helps def- Staging helps define a space. Sometimes you walk into a room, it's like, what the hell is this used for? Staging will help define that space. Uh, st- st- statistics show that uh, staging helps homes sell faster and for more money. Uh, that's why we, we, we like to stage all of our homes. Uh, and and now, now staging too doesn't mean that you have to, that you can't live there. It doesn't mean that you can't use some of your own stuff. Uh, what a stager will oftentimes do is they'll come in. And if you're still going to be living in the home, we'll just look at what you've got and maybe, maybe declutter some stuff, maybe bring in a, a few focal pieces, but we're going to use your dining table because it fits perfectly there. You know? So uh, just be, when I say staging, that doesn't mean get everything out of your home and then bring in all new stuff. Oftentimes we'll just use what you've got and, and try and minimize it a little bit and minimize it, make rooms feel bigger, help define spaces and things like that. So we do offer that to all of our customers. Uh, it's included in our listing package. And so if you do want to uh, have some you know, free staging, free consultation, uh, we, can, we can definitely do all that for you. Um, preparing your house for maximum sta- sale. I, I mean, it, pretty much I, what else do I need to say about staging? Um, 32% of realtors say it increases the, the sale price by 1% to 5%. 16% say it increases the sale price 6 to 10%. Uh, only 1% says it has a negative impact. I can't for the life of me figure out what that 1% would say that the negative impact of staging would be. Uh, 3% say it increases 11 to 15%. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers don't lie. Uh, is effective staging... 49% say it has a, an effect on buyers. 96% of buyers agents say that staging has an effect on some buyers when, when some buyers view the home. 81% says it makes it easier to visualize the property as a future home. The other thing too is, is making sure that we depersonalize the house, not only declutter, but depersonalize, take your family photos down and things like that. So I'm not going to read all of these. Staging helps. It sells it quicker. It sells it for more money. What room should we stage? Do we have to stage the whole house? No. You know, stage the main living areas, the living room, the kitchen, the master bedroom, the dining room, the bathrooms, uh, kids' bedrooms, guest bedrooms. Eh, you don't, you don't have to. Sometimes we'll just put a couple of little small things in there. You don't have to stage the entire house if you don't want to. Um, we do offer free staging consul- consultation and free basic staging, as I said. Uh, oftentimes, we'll use what you already have. We may reconfigure some things. We may bring in some additional uh, you know, show pieces to, re- you know, to add that wow factor. Okay. Um, help you come up with a game plan, help you decide. So um, and one thing too, I want to, I want to talk about too, is just, is negotiating. Um, uh, preparing your house to sale. It's so important. Negotiating is such a powerful skill and it's something that I've been teaching and training on for gosh, probably 10 or 12 years now. You definitely want a strong negotiator on our team. Um, for, for, for most people, your home is your biggest asset um, everybody knows a realtor. I understand that some people have, a, 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 you know, realtors that are maybe family members and, and you feel obligated to use them a, a more power to you. I absolutely encourage you to do that. Um, just make sure that they know their stuff. Make sure that there's a lot of part-time realtors out there. Uh, there's a lot of realtors, um, 80%, 87%, I think 80%, is 80, 87% of realtors fail in the first five years. And so you want somebody with the skills and the training to represent you and get the highest price possible. This was a great quote that I received from a customer. Uh, John was a, a military veteran and uh, says, hello, I'll, I've worked with many realtors uh, for many years. And I can honestly say without a doubt that Scott Stafford with EXP Realty is the most aggressive individual you will work for. Now, I hope he means aggressive in a good way. Uh, I really did uh, some strong negotiating for, for him and his, his, his just gorgeous family, just such a, a great person, a great family. Uh, I, I feel like we've become friends. We still stay in contact with one another. Uh, even before I arrived here from California, he was physically looking at homes and sent me awesome walkthrough videos. As a retired Marine, after 23 years, I have an eye for individuals with the right attitude, motivation, and who will go the extra mile for their clients. That is Scott, we went through numerous homes and he found us the perfect home where we will be happy for many years. Thanks for your stellar service. So um, just making sure having an, uh, someone who negotiates on your behalf to, to get you the best possible, either sale or buy. Um, I just thought I would share that with you. 
Uh, I've been uh, I've been training people in sales and negotiation for ten years all over the country and real estate uh, uh, fundamentals and whatnot. So it's definitely something in my wheelhouse. Okay, last but not least, we want to keep moving here, uh, keep rocking and rolling. Marketing is one of my favorite things to talk about. Does marketing really matter in a seller's market? Absolutely, it does. Uh, marketing has changed over the years, and and I really feel like most agents have not adapted to that change. As I said, the average the average experience that a realtor has is five years. Eighty seven percent of realtors uh, fail in the first five years, and this is the one that blows my mind. It was sixteen percent of realtors are actually actively using social media on a, on a repeat basis, actively using social media and digital marketing, only 16%. That just blows my mind. And that tells me that, that there are a lot of realtors out there. God bless them. Nothing. nothing I'm not, I'm not knocking them. Uh, everybody does things different, but they're, they're doing things that worked 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, before social media, before digital marketing, before funnels, before sales funnels. Um, you know, you, you think about how important it, marketing is. Uh, why do companies pay uh, to, to have a Super Bowl ad? The average Super Bowl ad is $6.5 million dollars for 30 seconds of screen time. Boy, if that's not a gamble, if that commercial bombs, man, you, you, you're done. Uh, but it, you know, now on the other hand, I get it. If you want to roll the dice and you have an amazing commercial, it, it could change your, your company. Uh, and, and there's been, you know, uh, GoDaddy was one of those back in the day when the GoDaddy, man, their, their commercials were great. Um, they, they had uh, uh, Super Bowl ads and it obviously exploded their business. Uh, but my question to you, though, is would you, you know, if you were a business owner, uh, would you rather spend $6.5 million on, on 30 seconds of screen time? Or would you rather spread that $6.5 million out over a uh, one year of optimized online digital marketing and social media advertising? Which one do you think would pay off better? You know, I'm, I come from the camp of saying that, you know, let's spend that money on social media marketing and digital marketing. Um, so what we do is we tap the power of social media and digital marketing. Uh, as I said, 16% of realtors are using social media. And I, and I uh, question on, you know, uh, are they even using it right? So some of the things that we do to market our properties is we do a custom property funnel. Okay. So we do a website that is... Uh, specific to your home. So if you live on 123 Elm Street, uh, we are going to have a, a, a website, uh, 123elmstreet.com. And it's got videos on it. It's got 3D tours on it. It's got maps on it. It's got some information about the area. And we drive traffic to that property. We call it a funnel. If you can picture a funnel, we create the website. We drive traffic to that. Uh, we use targeted traffic. We capture the user's information. Uh, we capture their, their email address, uh, sometimes phone number, depending on the site. And we can do retargeting. So anybody that shows uh, an interest in that particular website, we have pixels set up on our website and we can retarget uh, ads through Facebook and whatnot. And then we have automated follow-up campaigns. So this one thing right here, having a custom property funnel, uh, really, I feel, sets us aside from what a lot of people are doing. Uh, 3D walkthroughs, 35% of the buyers out there in the market are millennial buyers, and 80% of those millennial buyers are going to purchase properties in the next 20 years. It's so important. They're, they're tech people. They're looking at properties on their phones and their iPads and their, their whatnot. So it's important to have a 3D walkthrough. Um, on the house where they can use their mouse and they can walk through the house. And th this is an example of one here. Uh, they can walk through the house and see what the space looks like uh, uh, on their own time when they're on their iPad or at home. You can see over on the left-hand side, it's got the dollhouse view where you can look at the overview of it. You can go outside. It's so important to be able to, to show this stuff. It's an ex extra expense on our part, uh, but it does really, really make, make the, uh, the listing pop. Okay. So we like to do those. Uh, once we do that, we also come up with a 2d floor plan. Okay. This is, um, this is something that once again is very helpful to have on the listing. You don't see many of these, but it's nice to be able to look at room sizes and look at the flow of the room before we even go out to see it. Uh, 96 or 97% of home buyers start their search online. So if I can walk through this house with a 3D home, uh, you know, with a mouse or a, a finger on my iPad, and then I can also look at the floor plan, that's going to create that excitement and, and get more people looking at your house. We use Facebook ads to the website, captures their information 
information. We have email and text sequence follow-ups. We capture phone numbers. We have chat functions and we use pixels for retargeting ads. Once that person shows an interest in something, we can say, okay, this person now has an interest in buying homes and we can target those people specifically with more ads that are homes that they're looking for. Okay. Uh, what do we have here? Okay. Uh, marketing videos. So we, we always do marketing videos as well. And it's, it's kind of like the 3d walkthrough, but it's more of a, I don't know, a, a produced marketing thing. So this is an example of a listing video that we do on all of our properties. It's kind of cool. Just shows the area a little bit. And then we start to walk through the inside of the house. Just shows, highlights some of the features of the house. So generally these videos are three to four minutes. Um, again, just adds excitement and uh, kind of lets somebody kind of see it that, that uh, maybe don't have the capability of doing the, the, uh, the 3D digital walkthrough. So we kind of hit both angles there, okay? Uh, another thing we do is we want to make sure we get professional photos. Um, amateur photos versus professional photos. Here's an example of a, of a house I sold, an amateur photo, and then we go hire a professional. Which one do you think is going to sell that house better? That one? Shaded, wrong time of day, uh, not properly exposed, or the professional picture, okay? Same house, which one's going to look better in your listing, okay? Amateur photos, dining room. Actually kind of blurry, not a great picture at all. Doesn't really give it a sense of space. Professional photo, okay? Same room, dining room, a little different angle. Dining room, professional photo, okay? Kitchen, not bad. Nice countertops, got a little staging going on in there. Okay, amateur photo, professional photo. You can see the wide angle lenses, the, the lighting's better, everything pops better. Uh, this one really shows it. Look at, you know, pay attention. And, and I don't have amateur photos of this one, but, but take it, this is a house that I renovated. Um, take a picture of the professional photos. Notice how the outside looks. It's beautiful. You know, the inside, everything is crystal clear. Everything is lit perfectly, but the outside is not oversaturated. Often, oftentimes, if you're not doing uh, professional photos, that outside will not pop as much like that. So professional photos, we, we do professional photos on all of our, uh, all of our listings. Okay. Uh, again, professional photo. Here's something interesting. Uh, you'd never know this. Uh, you, if you really look close, you'll see that the microwave over the, the oven is missing. Um, we also, our electrician broke one of the lights. I believe it was the one in the front there. I'm talking about those pendant lights hanging over the, uh, over the, uh, the eating bar there. And uh, the professional photographer came in and I'm like, oh man, I, I don't want to have this picture with a broken light. And so the glass wasn't there, that little oval shaped glass. And so he copied and pasted and, and fixed it. And you'd never know if I didn't point it out for you. So professional photos, uh, definitely, they can do a lot to, uh, to, to fix things as you go. Okay. Again, another professional photo shows it beautifully inside. And there's that fake light. You'd never tell. I, I don't know how he did that so good. Um, actually, you know what? Looking at the two, the two lights on the right, I think it might have been the far one that was broken because I see the same. Anyway, doesn't matter. You get the idea. Professional photos, same house, open space, uh, very, very well staged, uh, very minimal. It just gives it a sense of room. Uh, aerial and drone photos, another thing, it, very, very important today's market. Um, to, uh, I, I am a, a licensed drone pilot. We have to get uh, FAA, FAA. We have to go through a class and get an uh, 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 unmanned uh, aircraft uh, uh, license to be able to fly drones for commercial use. Uh, I do have that. We do uh, drone footage on all of our videos. We get drone uh, photos and we do drone video, uh, something that we just recently started adding. And that's uh, no cost. We, we provide that. But, uh, you know, people, uh, people expect that stuff now. In addition to that, we do all of your, your typical flyers. Uh, one of the things that we do um, in our marketing campaigns is we do zip flyers. So that goes, all these flyers go out to 8,600 agents in Washington. So your house is going out to 8,600 agents right when it hits the market, all of Washington state in the, in the Northwest area here, Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia. Um, so 8,600 uh, email flyers go out showing your property in its best light with a link to that specific website where we capture information. And then we obviously do print flyers as well.
more marketing that we do. Facebook ads, uh, Facebook ads for specific things, Facebook ads for specific properties, Facebook ads for buyers. Uh, often you, you could very possibly have found this video from a Facebook ad. Uh, we also advertise in uh, uh, many, many groups that we're a part of in Facebook. Groups are a great place to advertise. Not a lot of, uh, I see a few of them, but not a lot of the people do that. Uh, just these groups alone that we're part of here that we advertise listings in, um, there's over 310,000 members alone. So that means a lot of eyeballs on your house. We do more marketing than the average realtor. I, I truly, truly believe that. Um, online syndication. When your listing goes live with us, it goes out on realtor.com, trulia.com, redfin.com, good old Zillow, HomeSnap, homes.com, Facebook, uh, our website, Olympia Home Source, Estately, Rocket Homes, uh, EXP's uh, website. There's tons and tons of, tons of websites that your property will be looked at uh, all over the country, all over the world, really. Why is all of this important to you? Millennial buyers, you know, tech, they're, they're more tech savvy. They're more, they're, they're more techie people. Millennial buyers, 35% of the marketplace, 80% of them are going to be buying a home in the next two years. 89% of buyers across demographics increasingly look to web and mobile tools to narrow down their list of properties. So we try and be as innovative as we can. Uh, and when something new comes up, we're going to look at it. If some new marketing thing comes up, well, we're going to be on the cutting edge of it. And we want to look at it. Uh, real estate listings with more visual content like video receive 403 more inquiries compared to those without video. If that doesn't sell you on it right there, I don't know what does. 40% of home buyers found interactive maps very useful, while 40% felt the same about virtual tours. Those are the virtual 3D tours that we talked about. 92% of home buyers search the internet before contacting an agent. In 2020, 97% use the internet to do their home search. Listings, this get this one, listings with 3D tours sold up to 9% higher and closed up to 31% faster. 76% of homes uh, buyers used mobile devices when searching for homes. According to the multiple listing service statistics, properties with aerial image are 68% more likely to sell than woes without. Do you see why we do staging, um, consultation on staging, uh, drone footage, 3D walkthroughs, videos, all of that stuff, uh, it, because the numbers don't lie. And all of these numbers came from various different sources. I didn't cite each one of them. Some of them for the National Association of Realtors. Some of them are for, uh, from uh, staging um, associations. Some of them are for from uh, the, the, our local MLS as well. So, uh, but just some numbers, some food for thought. More exposure means more offers. More offers means more money in your pocket as a seller. So that's why we do what we do. So we do MLS syndication, staging, professional videos, drone footage, video walkthrough, traditional marketing, uh, email and text marketing, custom single property websites, 3D walkthroughs, zip flyers, Facebook groups, social media ads, retargeting, okay? All of that stuff. And, and I'll be honest, what a lot of the realtors do, especially in a, in a market like this, uh, they, it's easy to get lazy. Eh, could we just put the house on the MLS? Of course we could. Would it sell? Probably would if we price it right and it's a decent home. Absolutely. Our goal, though, is to get more people looking at it uh, and, and selling it for more money. It's as simple as that. So does marketing matter even in a seller's market? You're damn right it is. And uh, we're pretty good at it. Okay. So recap. We went over what's really happening in the market. Uh, timing, pricing, preparation, marketing. Gave you some pro tips on things. And uh, the next step for you is to uh, set up a phone conversation. If you're actually, and there's my dog barking right at the end of the, the video. If you're truly looking at selling your house in the next week, in the next month, in the next year, in the next two years, let's at least just set up a phone cons con uh, consultation with me and let's get that parrot report started. That's step number one. Phone con consultation, find out what your needs are, what your desires are, and uh, we'll do everything we can to help you. And then we'll get that pair report started, which will, is the equity report, which was basically going to tell you how much you would net today right now if your house sold. Um, Scott Stafford, my number is 360-790-7164. Take a screenshot of that. Uh, take a picture of it. My email address is Scott. And notice I spell my name with one T. Uh, oftentimes when I don't get emails, that is where it happens. Uh, so it's Scott, S-C-O-T dot Stafford, S-T-A-F-F-O-R-D at exprealty.com. 
Uh, our mission really is to provide outstanding level of service, education, and expertise in the real estate community and beyond. Our focus is to put our customers' needs before our own and build lasting relationships through collaboration, communication, innovation, and integrity. I hope you found uh, this very helpful. Our core values, service, community, collaboration, innovation, integrity, communication, transparency, flexibility, determination, and most importantly is to have fun. We enjoy what we do. Uh, real estate has been a passion of mine since uh, for 30 years. It's all I've ever done. It's all I've ever known. And I don't know what I would do if I wasn't doing this. So definitely, uh, definitely uh, would love to have the opportunity to work with you, uh, work with you as a partner and uh, be your trusted source for real estate. So again, contact us. Thank you, you guys. I know this is a lot of information and I really appreciate you guys spending the time with me. If there's anything I can help you with, uh, pick up the phone, give me a call, shoot me a text message, and let's just have a conversation about what your goals and needs are. And if we can help you, great. If not, hey, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to help out, give you referrals, any, anything, um, anything to, to help you uh, in, in the real estate industry. So thank you guys again. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you got some stuff out of it. Uh, if you're watching this online, uh, be sure and like our Facebook page. Be sure and like the video and subscribe. Uh, thanks again. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.